So my name is John O'Connor. Uh, I was a professor of engineering science in the university. I came here in 1964 as a university lecturer. And uh, quite shortly afterwards, I met an orthopedic surgeon called John Goodfellow, who had just been appointed as a consultant surgeon at the Nuffield Orthopedic Center in Oxford. And uh, in the mid 70s, no, in the early 70s, we be began to think about knee replacement. And um, the result of those thoughts are embodied in this little model. So this is a model of the left knee of a human being. And it contains on the inside, in the inside compartment, an Oxford knee, an Oxford knee prosthesis. Uh, the essence of this invention was that the device contains a mobile meniscal bearing, which acts much the same way as the menisci of the natural knee. And the upper surface of this bearing is a spherical socket, which fits exactly the shape of the surface of the component which is attached to the femur. And the lower surface is flat, which exactly fits the flat surface of the component attached to the tibia. And when the surgeon snaps the bearing into place, then we have a prosthesis. And the, uh, the unique thing about this is that uh, if you look at, at the model from the side, then as the joint flex uh, bends and straightens, the plastic bearing can move backwards and forwards on the tibia. It can slide freely relative to both the femur and the tibia. And when you twist your leg, which we do quite a lot in activity, it can slide backwards and forwards so that the, uh, the bearing accommodates to the movements of the knee as demanded by muscles and ligaments. I should have said these elastic uh, elements here represent the ligaments. So the device accommodates to the movements demanded by the muscles and the ligaments, while at the same time remaining in full conformity with the metal components in all positions. The first operation was carried out on June the 30th, 1976. And initially, we implanted components that looked like that. So one set in the inside of the joint and one set in the outside. And that went on until about 1982. But during that time, we discovered that in very many patients with osteoarthritis, that quite a lot of the joint was still undamaged. The ligaments were still intact. And the damage was limited to the front part of the surface of the inside compartment of, inside compartment of the knee, both on the femur and the tibia, where the nice clean cartilage that you see here is completely stripped away. The bones are now fully exposed with their nerve endings and that hurts. That is extremely painful. But with the partial knee replacement like this, we simply recover those bits of the surfaces that are damaged. We retain all the ligaments. And so we hope that this will give patients a very good function. And thus it turns out. So the hope that we would minimize wear has been borne out by clinical experience. The hope that we would minimize loosening has been borne out by clinical experience. Uh, the patients, while still loaded with painkillers, uh, are uh, asked to walk two hours after, after they're wheeled out of the operating theater. And many of them, many surgeons, send their patients home the same evening. This is a mathematical model of the human knee, as seen from the side, when the surfaces have been replaced by the Oxford knee prosthesis. The picture on the left 
will show how the femur moves on the tibia as the joint bends and straightens. And the picture on the right will show how the femur moves on the tibia when it is pulled backwards and forwards on a stationary tibia. The uh, femur is shown here, the tibia here, and the prosthesis, the femoral component, the component attached to the back of the femur, is shown, as seen from the side, is a, sur a surface with a circular arc, and the tibial surface is flat. In between the two, we have a meniscal bearing shown in yellow. And the upper surface of the meniscal bearing matches the shape of the femoral component exactly. The lower surface matches the shape of the tibial component. These arrays of lines represent the cruciate ligaments. The green lines, the anterior cruciate ligament. The white lines, the posterior cruciate ligament with two distinct and separate bundles. Uh, at the front and at the back of the line of the joint, we have a very simple representation of the thigh muscles at the front and at the back with the kneecap, the patella. When we animate the joint, you can see that as the knee bends, the meniscal bearing moves backwards on the tibia, and as the knee straightens, it moves forwards again. The backwards and forwards movement of about one centimeter, a little over one centimeter. And looking at the ligaments, you can see that these movements are possible because the ligaments slacken and tighten again, but they do not stretch, as in the picture on the right. So this is the way the bones would move on each other in a perfectly unloaded joint. It is a model of mobility. And the movements of the femur, the femur rolls backwards and forwards on the tibia in order to minimize ligament strains. And then finally, notice that the kneecap, the patella, slides onto the femoral component of the prosthesis when the joint is sufficiently bent. Now on the other hand, uh, here's the uh, same picture in effect, but this time we allow the femur to be pushed backwards and forwards on a stationary tibia. When the femur is pushed backwards, you see the anterior cruciate ligament in green, the fibers tighten progressively, while the fibers of the posterior cruciate ligament slacken. And when the femur is pushed forwards, the posterior cruciate ligament is tightened progressively, and the anterior cruciate ligament slackens progressively. So these are really two extreme examples, which in any activity will be superimposed upon each other in different ways. Every activity represents some form of movement, some pattern of movement, and some pattern of loading. So every activity it will be some different combination of these two effects. And uh, in each extreme, and therefore in each activity, we notice that the surfaces of the prosthesis remain in full conformity over the whole range of movement with very large contact areas and low contact stresses so that we would expect to achieve very low wear rates when these devices are used in clinical practice and this is how it has turned out to be. And also because uh, the components allow uh, the movements of these two extreme examples while staying in full conformity, we would expect that in every activity we would get a good function and a physiological result. And that indeed is also been demonstrated in clinical practice. For instance, this is a model of the simple leg lift exercise, so called, in which the femur remains stationary and we use our quadriceps muscles to raise and lower the leg, the tibia, against gravity. And here the knee is straight. The tension in the patellar tendon, as it's called, is maximum. And it pulls the tibia upwards 
or pulls the tibia forwards relative to the femur, a movement that is resisted by uh, extreme tension in the anterior cruciate ligament. And when we animate the model, and the quadriceps allows the leg to drop and to lift again, you see that the anterior cruciate ligament slackens as the leg is dropped and retightens as the leg is lifted again. And the net effect of the combination of movement, of bending and extension, bending and straightening on the one hand, and the changing forces in the ligament on the other hand, mean that the pattern of movement of the meniscal bearing on the tibia is quite different to the picture you saw previously, the picture on the left. The bearing stays, if we watch it, on the way down, essentially stationary on the tibia until we get to a, an angle of flexion of about 60 degrees. So this pattern of movement is characteristic of this exercise, and every exercise will have its own pattern of movement. The important thing is, in designing a prosthesis, is to ensure that the surfaces, the shapes of the surfaces as such, as will allow all such combinations of movement. And with this design, you see that in all positions, the meniscal bearing stays in full, fully conforming contact with both the femoral component and the tibial component. And so we would hope for minimum wear of the components, as indeed has been demonstrated clinically. Thank you.